audio. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Is that working? That's weird because I didn't change anything. I just opened up the audio monitor. Hey, hey, somebody says it's working now. Is that you? Thank you. Oh, he said it's working on it. Yeah. All right. I have no idea why the audio wasn't working. Sorry. But hey, I would pay $70 to buy that light bulb. Let's let's see how we can tie this in to manufacturing. All right. So what are the things that's like a light bulb in our manufacturing processes? Uh, so what, what, what do we see that's like a light bulb? Yeah, go ahead. So the uh, close. Oh. So the uh, the tooling in our machining process is sort of like the light bulb in my equation, right? And so by the tooling, I mean the end mills, I mean the um, the the cutting inserts in um, in turning exercises, right? So the tooling is the the wear parts, the parts that wear out while we're doing our machining exercises. So when should we change the tool? Yes. So we want to change the tool before explosion. Right? So before the tool does this, we want to have changed it. All right. How do we know when the tool is going to explode? Yes. Oh, you know, the pessimist might be right more often than the optimist, but the optimist has way more fun when they're right. How do we know when it's going to explode? All right. So, so we can just before the explosion, who's heard this in lab, by the way? All right, so there's a few hands that have come up. Just before the explosion makes loud, bad noise. When, I, when I'm training novice operators on CNC machine tools, I was like, all right, so here's the emergency stop button, right? When you hear a bad noise, press the button. You're like, well, how will I know if it's a bad you will know if it's a bad noise, right? Immediately obvious when it's a bad noise, right? What's the worst case if you press the button and, and the noise was only annoying, not bad? Yeah. Right, you start the program again. There is some chance that by pressing the emergency stop button, the way the tool slows down and stuff like that, because it, it doesn't, there's no instantaneous stop, right? It applies a break to stop the tool. There is some chance that that would cause the tool to break but it's really unlikely. So the worst case, if you press the emergency stop when you don't need to, is that you, you're embarrassed. That's really the worst case. In fact, sometimes we sneak up behind a machine when somebody, I shouldn't tell it. All right, whatever. Sneak up behind the machine when somebody's doing something that they're really nervous about and hit the machine. Make them jump and see if they hit the e-stop. <laughs> it's not very nice but I'm not going to say it's never happened. <laughs> okay. So it makes it, so is that the best way to know? Yeah. Oh, you'd like data. So what happens is the tool manufacturers will do these tool wear experiments, these tool life experiments. So what do you think happens? So unless the tool explodes because you drove it into something, Right. So if you, for example, if you stop, if you don't spin the spindle and you drive the end mill into the workpiece, I guarantee you it will break every time. That's not what I'm talking about here. That's just stupid. You can't fix stupid, but you, you can avoid it by, well, how do we fix stupid? Actually, you can fix stupid. How do we fix it? Education. All right. So we can fix stupid. <laughs> 
some people say it's stupid for me to let you guys have such free access to the machine tools before you know everything. I say you can't learn anything if you don't have access. Okay, so they do these toolware experiments. What do you think happens before the loud noise starts? Before it's even close to exploding? Yeah. Well, you could do that, right? You could design an experiment where you run the tools until they break. And some people do that. But you go ahead. So the cutting forces are going to change. So there's actually systems out there that, uh, that you can monitor the cutting force. And when the load for a particular operation changes behind, beyond a certain amount, you can have that flag the operator and tell them, hey, it's time to change this tool. Um, of course, when we're measuring, if we're doing inspection as the parts come off the line, we can say, hey, these parts, so what's likely to happen as the tool wears out? Let's look at a, a lathe cutting insert here. So there's the, uh, the cutting part. Maybe there's a little chip breaker here. And so it's, so if the workpiece is spinning this way in my document, right, then the feed would be in that direction. And maybe we're doing this. That's a big cut, but you get the idea, right? So we're feeding this way. As we're going along here, if we're making the chip all along that edge, what do you think is going to happen as that edge wears out? So you said cutting forces will go up. And the reason the cutting forces are going to go up is because that's going to become more round, less sharp, right? Less sharp is more round. That's going to become more round and it's going to change that shear angle. It's going to change the physics of how the cutting edge meets the chip. And it's going to make the shear plane longer. When the shear plane gets longer, the cutting force has to go up, right? Right. The cutting force has to go up if the shear plane gets longer. So as that's happening, which is happening in this angle that we can't see in this drawing, as that's happening, if the force goes up, what else goes up? The pressure goes up. If the pressure goes up, what else goes up? Heat goes up. So tools break down because of excessive heat getting in the tool or in the chip. That's one of the reasons we use coolant in our machining processes. We spray the coolant on there or we spray air on there to take heat away from the operation to extend the tool life. So, and also the coolant or air will help to evacuate the chips, which gets them out of the way, out of the hole or whatever it is you're making. So, it's going to wear. And so what they do is they do these tool wear experiments. They cut for, I think I mentioned this. We did a project a while ago where we automated the tool wear experiment for a company where they cut for a little while, camera goes in and looks at the edge of the tool. Cut for a little while, camera goes in and looks at the edge of the tool. And you can see little microscopic changes at first on the edge of the tool, on the bottom of the tool there. And, and those will get bigger and bigger and bigger. That will happen faster with more heat. So the more heat you put in, the faster that's going to happen. It's a uh, it, part of it's chemistry. So the the uh, the coating will wear off physically, but also so you want your tool to be harder than the workpiece material. Does that make sense? Intuitively, you guys got that, right? I didn't have to tell you you want the tool to be harder than the workpiece material. So we should cut everything with a diamond-coated tool, right? Diamonds are pretty hard. One of the hardest things we can make, right? Because we can make, we can manufacture diamonds, so it's not the expense. Manufactured diamonds are pretty cheap. We can make diamonds, coat the edge of the tool with them. That'd be pretty cool, right? You, could, you can absolutely buy diamond-coated tooling. It is fantastic for cutting aluminum, brass, things like that. When wouldn't you want to use a diamond? Diamond coated tool. When I do when I do the machining of ceramics, I always use diamond coated tool or diamond tooling. Usually it's diamond bits in a grinding wheel. When don't you want to use diamonds? Anybody? Who's had ES two thousand one? When, when don't I want to use diamonds? What are diamonds made out of? 
What else does carbon go in? Okay. There's not a lot of carbon in aluminum. Diamonds break down at high heat. Diamonds break down at high heat. There's extremely high heat happening here at the chip tool interface. Like extremely high heat. So the diamonds could just simply break down because of the heat. But if this is iron, and you add carbon to it, what do you make? Steel. If you have iron or ferrous materials, it's one of the reasons we divide up our tooling in the in the machine shop between we. It's stupid. We call it ferrous tools and non-ferrous tools which implies that the tools are made out of iron or not. None of the tool, well, none of the tools that we use in lab are made out of iron. It, it's possible because if you use, they do have steel tooling, hardened steel and, and tool steel, but we don't use any steel tooling in the lab for the most part. The drills are steel, the drill mills are steel. But other than that, all the other end mills are, uh, are ceramic, they're uh, silicon carbide. So you are making the workpiece harder because you're putting more diamond into the iron with the heat of the reaction. And so when you start cutting steel with diamond tools, it just eats up the diamond because uh, the steel likes to absorb carbon because it just steel's happier when it has more carbon. So, uh, so, so yeah, we want hard tools, but we can't always coat them with diamond. So, all right. So as this is happening, if, it's heat that's the primary factor. Or is, heat is a significant factor in how fast the tools wear out. If you can keep them cooler, they don't wear out as fast. So we don't, we don't just use coolant on our grinding processes. We actually have chillers in line to keep the coolant cool, to take the heat out of the water after it sprays on the part and then it goes down to the bottom of the machine. So if you can remove the heat from the process, what will it do? If I can remove heat from the process faster, it'll make the tools last longer, right? The longer the tool lasts, the, the less I can afford to pay for it, right? Right? So if the tool lasts a long time, I can... Now it's... The more I can afford to pay for it, right? So if the tool lasts twice as long and costs twice as much, should I buy it? Every time, right? Because I eliminated one tool change. What goes into the cost of changing the tool? Right, so... So the cost of a tool change, uh, C, we'll call that C, T, C, cost of a tool change. So what are the factors? The cost of the tool, right? So that each time you change a tool, you, you incur the cost of the tool. Yeah. Uh, whoever you're paying, are you... So you're, whoever you're paying, and it's the amount of time that it takes to change the tool, right? So the, the time to change the tool. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys got all that. All right, so we've got the time that it takes to change that tool, but the time is distributed between different things, right? So some of that time is sort of non-productive cost. Part of that time is the cost of cutting. There's the cost of changing tools. There's the cost of the tool itself. And there's the cost of the raw material if we want to know how much it, does it cost to cut something, right? Because do we really care how much it costs to change the tool? I and mean, the, the cost to change the tool is the cost of the tool 
and the cost of the time that goes into changing the tool, right? So let's think, what does it cost to cut something? What does our customer want? Customer wants the part. Customer wants us to add value to the part to make it the thing that they want. Okay. So if we look at... So if we look at our costs, what are some non-productive costs in machining? Yeah. Quality control. Quality control is non-productive unless the customer is willing to pay extra for the certificate, right? So what are some other non-productive costs? Yeah. Changing of tool is non-productive. Although I think, did we add that in? We, bro we broke that out as a line, didn't we? Cost of the tool, cost of changing tools. We broke that out as a separate line item. But yeah, it's not productive. There's no value in changing the tool other than not exploding. What's the cost of exploding the tool? Yeah. That's the problem. You could let them go until they explode, and except it might damage the part, right? It also is unpredictable when it's going to explode, so you don't know who's going to be able to do the changing. All right, so we've got... Our non-productive costs. What else, what else is non-productive? Yeah. The time you spent programming. Non-productive. You have to do it. Non-productive. What else is non-productive? Yes. The time you spend not making the part because you're maintaining the machine tool. Non-productive. Have to do it. Non-productive. What else is non-productive? Anybody, anything else? All right, but there's some good examples of some non-productive costs. So what's the cost of cutting? So there's some power that goes into it, some electricity that goes into it. What else? The person running the machine, what else? Yep. The cost of the fact that you own the machine and you own the facility where it is. What else? Is there anything else? That's it, right? So it's the cost of owning the equipment and having it in a facility. It's the cost of the electricity that goes to power the equipment. It's the cost of the person running the machine when the cut's happening. So it's the cost of doing the cutting. Now, when we're doing the cutting, presumably we're adding value to the part, right? Presumably. Is this the only value added activity on the in the equation? Is the cost of cutting the only value added activity? I guess the, the cost of the raw materials is value added also, right? But these two are value added. Everything else is value subtractive or cost directly, right? So cost of changing tools, we went into that. It takes the time that it takes to change the tool plus the cost of the tool. Okay, so which ones of these are factors of time? So which one of those is a related to time? Yeah. Uh, so cost of raw material is could could have a time factor in it, right? Yeah. Because the cost of materials varies over time, and actually in the last couple of years it, that's been pretty volatile. So this could actually, but typically we separate that out. We say that the materials were not a, not related to the, because compared to the, the time scale at which the material cost changes, compared to the time scale of the cost of cutting is pretty small, right? So who's, who's been in the lab when we were changing the tool? How long does it take-ish? So it takes about 10 minutes to change the tool. The parts you guys have been making, how long does it take to cut them? 10 minutes? Yeah. Our, our target time is five minutes. We, we, we can't, if we had better fixturing and better machine tools, we could get them all cut in 10 minutes or five minutes. Um, but I digress, right? So the cost of change, so the time associated with changing tools almost equals the cost of making a part, right? So 
if you can if you can find the equation for how time goes into all of these you could actually maximize this for the time it takes to do the cutting now we could uh, break down each one of these and you can look at the slides about the breakdown here but you can figure out what's the time for each one of these as you go through here you can actually do a Taylor equation substitution here to solve this for time. And you could plot the results and you'll find out that the cost of cutting goes down as you increase speed. So the cost of doing the cut, the value added activity goes down as you increase speed. Does that make sense? The cost of the tool and tool change goes up as you increase speed, does that make sense? So as you increase speed, heat goes up. When you increase heat, tool life goes down. So as you do this, so if you plot those two graphs together, this is slightly shifted here, I see when I move the slide in, but you'll see that if you add those two graphs together, there's a local minimum, and that is the optimal speed to run your machine tool. And you could figure this out for every single cutting operation on every single part that you make. Just by doing the experiment, by learning the tool life, by understanding how the tool change cost is. Are you gonna do that? So you can figure this out for every single operation on every single part that you ever make. Are you gonna do that? You're shaking your head no. Why not? It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. So when are you going to do this? When you're repeating the same operation many times. When you're repeating the same operation many times. I told you about an MQP that we had here at WPI. I was working with a local manufacturer. It had seven machine tools making the same part 24 hours a day all year long. So they did this analysis for that operation. They also went around. They found some other problems. I, I mentioned that there was some problems in the, in the time varied from machine to machine. They figured that out. They actually suggested a couple changes in the tool path to make the time go down for the cost of, for the time of cutting. They were able to find with that single operation for those parts at that machine shop, a million dollars a year in savings, MQP. Million dollars a year in savings by figuring this out. So when you're running a lot of parts, you can do this analysis. If you're not running a lot of parts, if you're making one or two pieces, 10 or 100 or 1,000 pieces, are you going to do this analysis? What do you, yeah. Well, so... I'm now I'm thinking how much does it matter to that company? It doesn't matter. It has the M word. So even if it's an insignificant amount of money to the company, right? If you looked at the grand scheme of things, if you can tell your boss, I just saved us a million dollars a year, you're getting a bonus this year. Right, it doesn't matter. My my wife works at Johnson and Johnson. I last last time I checked, they're almost four hundred billion dollars in value. Right, four hundred billion. But if she comes to her boss and says, "Hey, we just saved one point two million dollars on this project," she's getting a bonus. I know that for a fact. <laughs> so so yeah. So even if it's insignificant, each business unit itself has to survive too. Right, so, uh, so that does matter. Um, all right, so in general though, when you're not making, when you're not running seven machines 24 hours a day to make this part, and you would make the part faster if you could, you're not gonna do an analysis like this. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna use at that moment when you're deciding things, when you're deciding how fast can I go? You're gonna use engineering judgment, right? 
it's we all have to use engineering judgment sometimes but if you're thinking about this when you use your engineering judgment your judgment will be better all right so that's what i want to talk about in this cost for cut you can optimize each operation based on the speed at which you do the operation and you can you can figure out these equations for any and it doesn't matter we're, we're using this cutting thing as an example when when we developed this model it was actually simply for using a bandsaw to cut steel we developed this model for using a bandsaw to cut steel to help the bandsaw blade manufacturer sell more bandsaw blades so this this research was all done to help the bandsaw blade manufacturer sell more bandsaw blades because their blade was more expensive but it lasted longer they had to educate their customers okay i don't want to look at that yeah just before oh in that uh the heat and uh time relationship it's on a log scale it's this guy radius that figured that out he got a nobel prize for it so that's cool and i have a haiku about it so that's cool um so our our project for the class project is this starting a manufacturing company right all right, so let's talk about that. If we go to, if you go to the syllabus, if you look at the group assignment here for this week's lecture, there's a link to it. If you go to Canvas, which I'm not logged into, and you click on the group assignment, there's a link to the instructions also. And I'll spread links out all over the place. Uh, do me a favor, don't be the group that Google searches M1800 well, I call this group three assignment, group assignment three, because I used to do three assignments and this was the final one. This is the only one you guys are doing. Ignore the fact that it says three. Do me a favor, don't Google M1800 group assignment and then just pick any set of instructions that you find there. There's problematic one term when a group did an excellent project, but it wasn't the assignment. And I had to question, so the immediate conclusion, right? We, we jump to conclusions, right? The immediate conclusion I jumped to is this must be a bunch of fraternity guys. And they got the fraternity brothers from last year's assignment and they just resubmitted it, right? That's the conclusion we jump to. Don't jump to conclusions, even if you have a mat. So follow the instructions that are linked to from canvas and from the syllabus. Okay, uh, we can create a company to create the M1800 Sterling engine. You guys have all of the CAD files or the design, the Esprit files for making a Sterling engine. You did your, what, do you have those? I'll make sure you have them. You may not have all of them. I'll make sure you have all those. But um, you need to determine startup costs. So we, we had that lecture, what, two weeks ago where we talked about the costs associated with starting up a machine shop. So I want you to determine startup costs. I want you to determine where you're going to work, how much the building is going to cost for the period of time. What we said, three years. I think the instructions. Oh, it says four years in the instructions here. We'll go with four years. So you're going to figure out how much it's going to cost to operate that building for four years. Make some assumptions about electricity cost, heating costs. You know, if you do it in Hawaii, you won't have a lot of heating costs your shipping costs will go up. But hey, you won't need a place to live because you could just sleep on the beach. It's a consideration. I haven't had anybody yet propose to do it in Hawaii, but I do have some friends that own a company there and that was one of the reasons they started it. Um, as the company starts, all right, so there are three partners. You guys are partners. Um, the first year that you run your business, you don't have to take a salary yourself. You could say that I have savings. I'm going to live off my savings for this first year. The second year the company's operating, you must pay yourselves something. Um, oh no, it says you may begin taking a salary. You may decide not to. Okay. Never mind. I lied. Uh, you should allow your investors to recover their initial investment by the end of the third year. So you're going to say, how much is it going to cost to start? How much money do we need to start and operate for up to three years? But you're going to pay back all of the investment by the end of three years. So you're going to make a plan that lets you do that. 
You're going to have to choose what machine tools you have. You're going to have to justify your production rate. So how fast are you going to make these parts? How do you know how fast you can make the parts? Yes. How do you know how fast you can make the parts? Uh, you not you don't need to use this equation now. But how do you know how fast each part, how, how long it takes to make each part? Um, the camp software. In the camp software, in a spree. If you select all the operations and go to the properties, it'll tell you the estimated cycle time. Take that estimated cycle time, put a little buffer on it for changing parts, right? So your goal with your business plan, no longer than four pages. Your goal with your business plan is to convince me to give you the amount of money that you asked for to start your company. So convince me that you understand how much it will cost to start the company, how much it will cost to operate it for three years, and how you'll be able to pay me back with the profits from selling the Sterling engines. Do we say, so what do you need to know about profit here? You need to know, so you can figure out the cost, right? There's a video linked here in the instructions that talks about how to figure out the cost. But you can figure out the cost, right? What do you need to know? You need to know that overhead cost about owning the building, right? Or, or renting the building, whatever you're doing. You need to know how much it costs to be in the building, how much it costs to have the machine tools for that period of time. And you need to know how much the raw materials cost, how much the labor costs. The raw materials and labor are both going to be directly related to how fast you can make the parts and how fast you can sell them. What's the other piece of information you need? You, you can guesstimate that. If you have trouble, just ask me and I'll give you some numbers to use. The price that you're going to sell it for is the critical piece of information here, right? If I could sell each one for a million dollars each, it's not going to be that hard to start this company. If I could sell each one for $9 each, it's not enough money to buy the materials. So you need to, we need to have a price point at which you can sell these. So what do you think? What are people going to pay for something like this? Anybody ever bought something like this? A little kit you can put together? Anybody ever bought like Legos? Or put together a Lego kit? That's pretty cool. What do those cost? What what's uh what's what's the cheapest Lego kit that you can buy cost ish? Really? That's for like a piece. Of Legos. I have kids. I buy Legos. If you tell me where I can buy a Lego kit for five dollars, I want to know. Yeah, I'm talking about like something that would be fun to put together with your daughter on a Saturday afternoon. It's like it's 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 minimum like twenty-five dollars, right? And up to like two fifty. You probably easily pay two fifty for Lego. Let's let's pick something in the middle. Let's say $73. We've done market research and we have determined that the market is willing to pay $73 for each one that we can make. Okay. So you're going to figure out how many do you have to make over that three, three year period to pay back your investors and pay yourself a salary. I think at some point in here, I say you have to take a salary. What's that? By the, end of the third year. By the end of the third year, you need to have paid back your investors, but I want to see four years of operation numbers. So I want to see what you're going to do after you've paid back the investors. Yeah. It's pretty unreasonable to expect you to not take a salary by the end of the third year. Uh, for the CAM project, uh, I'll have this posted before you get to lab today, but for or tomorrow, depending on when you go to lab. For the CAM project, the, uh, the Sterling engine base, the part that you've been making for the last two weeks, you're going to create a program to make the Sterling engine base. We will provide you with the solid model for the Sterling engine base with drawings, both sides, a, uh, the description of the stock material, and a tool list.
and then you use a spree to make a CAM program that can make that base or two CAM programs because it's two operations, right? That's the CAM project due at the end of the term. <laughs> if you've been following along in the CAM assignments, you can do it in an afternoon. If you haven't been following along in the CAM assignments, you're going to have a busy next two weeks. Okay? All right, sweet. See, tomorrow Tomorrow we're going to talk about technobabble, buzzwords, and lean manufacturing. I'm really sorry. I accidentally locked myself out of my room earlier today, so I missed the first 10 minutes. Um, well, that was perfect, because that's the 10 minutes that didn't have any audio. <laughs> 